Hello and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com, permanently archived, also at kirksvilletoday.com, linked, and pieville.net, our social medium. Today we're going to do the middle portion of chapter 18, which is all about Jews in the 20s in the USSR. This is Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, his history of Russian-Jew interactions. Let's go to it. Now we're going to pick up on page 564 and we're going to do to about 582. Again, this is the middle of chapter 18, which is all about the 20s. That is the first full decade following the so-called Russian Revolution, the October Revolution, or the properly the Jewish takeover of Russia. And we've heard last time, and the key for you to remember is that after the revolution in October 1917, Jews flocked to the capitals. Russia has multiple capitals, They're basically the main cities. They flocked to the capitals, and even though communism is ostensibly about class warfare that is scientifically inevitable as history marches through stages, one yielding to another. And even though the communists were officially against the bourgeois, the Jews were exempted because it was claimed they had been oppressed under the czar. So all the anti-bourgeois measures were taken against Russians, Russian noblemen, Russian merchants, Russian clergy, Russian uh, business leaders, etc. Their kids were discriminated against at school in favor of Jews. So what you see is essentially with any Jewish takeover of a nation, they replace the natural head of the nation or what the Russians call intelligentsia. And that's a word we actually use in English, pretty much transliterated. The backwards R, now it's not like I know Cyrillic a lot, but the backwards R in Cyrillic is pronounced Ia, so intelligentsia. There's a Jewish intelligentsia and a Russian intelligentsia. Now you have, under Bolshevism, a completely new replacement government. So they built a parallel government, or they have people flocking in, including from abroad, and including from the western and southern provinces, more <laughs> areas of Russian Empire. They flock into Moscow and St. Petersburg and, and Leningrad and these other capitals, they flock in and take over the administrative, and they are the ones who preserved the revolution when it might have been doused by whatever was left of the old Russian government and, and civil service. So the revolution is good for the Jews, perceived to be good for the Jews, and the revolution is perceived to be bad and perceived to be Jewish by the actual Russian people. But anyway, the point is, the Jews have cut off the Russian head with the revolution and replaced it with a Jewish head. And all the usual discrimination and lies and defamatory uh, media ensue. And so we're now looking at the decade after that from October 1917. We're looking at the 20s. This is the middle of three in which we'll cover this chapter 18, which is the 20s. So picking up on 564, we'll do about 18 pages today. When Leskov... In a report for the Polensky Commission, translator's note, a pre-revolution government commission, Leskov, in a report for the Polensky Commission, one by one refuted all the presumed consequences for Russians from the removal of restrictions on Jewish settlement in Russia. He couldn't have foreseen the great degree to which Jews would be participating in governing the country and the economy in the 20s. So Jews go from not being part of the government at all to being completely in control of it. That's what quote-unquote, Russian revolution means. The revolution changed the entire course of events, and we don't know how things would have developed without it. When, in 1920, Solomon Luria, translator's notes, a.k.a. Luri, L-U-R-I-E or L-U-R-I-A, when in 1920 Solomon Luria, a professor of ancient history in Petrograd, found that in Soviet, internationalist, and communist Russia, anti-Semitism was again on the rise, he was not surprised. So even, even the Russians who were part of the Communist Party, the Bolsheviks, did not like the Jew takeover. 
On the contrary, quote, events substantiated the correctness of his earlier conclusions, unquote, that the, quote, cause of anti-Semitism lies with the Jews themselves, which is something the Jew will never admit nowadays, and currently, quote, with or in spite of the complete absence of legal restrictions on Jews, anti-Semitism has erupted with a new strength and reached a pitch that could never have been imagined in the old regime. Well, naturally, because Jews with power do anti-white things. It's a racial deal with them. Russian, or more precisely Little Russian, anti-Semitism of past centuries and the early 20th century was blown away with its seeds by the winds of the October Revolution. Those who joined the Union of the Russian People, those who marched with their religious standards to smash Jewish shops, those who demanded the execution of Bilas, those who defended the royal throne, the urban middle class, and those who were with them or resembled them, or who were suspected to be like them, were rounded up by the thousands and shot or imprisoned. So again, nothing like that had ever happened to Jews in the entire Russian history as to what they did to Russians when they took power. Among Russian workers and peasants, there was no anti-Semitism before the revolution. This is attested to by leaders of the revolution themselves. Part of that is because Jews were restricted in where they could live, so they hadn't any experience of Jews other than some of them knew them as owners of taverns and liquors and uh, running plantations, etc. For the noblemen. The Russian intelligentsia was actively sympathetic to the cause of the oppressed Jews, and the children of the post-revolution years were raised only in the internationalist spirit. Again, that's the thing about communism. It's a global revolution. They, these are internationals. Jews have nationalism and international working for them through communism and Zionism, but for you, they're trying to force you into a globalist system where you mix your genes and disappear as a people, and thereby become no threat to them and, and simply provide cattle services to them. Stripped of any strength, discredited and crushed completely, where did anti-Semitism come from? We already described how surprising it was for Jewish-Russian emigres to learn that anti-Semitism had not died. They followed the phenomenon in the writings of socialists E.D. Kuskova and S.S. Maslov, who came from Russia in 1922. In an article in the Jewish Tribune, Kuskova states that anti-Semitism in the USSR is not a figment of the imagination and that, quote, in Russia, Bolshevism is now blending with Judaism. This cannot be doubted. She even met highly cultured Jews who were anti-Semites of the new, quote, Soviet type. Unquote. A Jewish doctor told her, quote, Jewish Bolshevik administrators ruined the excellent relations he had with the local population. A teacher said, quote, children tell me that I teach at a Jewish school because we have, quote, forbidden the teaching of the Ten Commandments and driven off the priest. Quote, there are only Jews in the narcomat of education. In high school circles from radical families, there is talk about the predominance of Jews. Quote, all these are quotes. Young people in general are more anti-Semitic than the older generation, and one hears everywhere, they showed their true colors and tortured us. Quote, Russian life is full of this stuff today, but if you ask me who they are, these anti-Semites, they are most of the society. How can the society be defined by its attitude towards one small minority? That's how obnoxious Judaism is. Everything is defined in relation to Jews and nothing else matters except your position on Jews. So widespread is this thinking that the political administration distributed a proclamation explaining why there are so many Jews in it. When the Russian proletariat needed its own new intelligentsia, mid-level intelligentsia, technical workers and administrative workers, not surprisingly, Jews who have before had been in the opposition came forward to meet them. I, I like my figure better. They simply cut off the Russian head and put their own head on it. So they have the Jewish head on a Russian body, and that works as well in Russia as it does in America today. The occupation by Jews of administrative posts in the new Russia, again, flocking to the capitals and taking over the administration of the new communist regime in the new Russia is historically inevitable. The occupation by Jews of administrative posts in the new Russia is historically inevitable and would have been the natural outcome, regardless of whether the new Russia had become KD, constitutional democrat, 
SR, socialist revolutionary, or proletarian, that is Bolshevik communist. Any problems with having Aaron Moisevich Tankelevich sitting in the place of Ivan Petrovich Ivanov needs to be, quote, cured. Kuskova parries, quote, in a constitutional democratic or socialist revolutionary Russia, again, that's not Bolshevism, that's a different shade of leftism, many administrative posts would have been occupied by Jews, but neither the cadets nor SRs would have forbidden teaching the Ten Commandments and wouldn't have chopped off heads. So the Bolsheviks are violent communist revolutionaries as opposed to like Fabian, which is a British term for degree by degree peaceful democratic socialist where they make their way mainly by lying and infiltration as opposed to violent bloody revolution. Stop Tanklevich from doing evil and there will be no microbe of anti-Semitism. That's correct. All attitude toward Jews is based in their behavior. So anti-Semitism as a rhetorical trick, we know it's completely invalid. It's simply a dirty word for the natural reaction Jew behavior always causes. Doesn't matter what other nation they are living and conspiring and skulking among, whether it's Arabs, Muslims, Indians in India, or Chinese or whites, Europeans. The Jewish emigre com community was chilled by Maslow's findings, Maslow's findings. Here was a tested SR with an unassailable reputation who lived through the first four years of Soviet power, and then he left in 22. Quote, Judeophobia is everywhere in Russia today. It has swept areas where Jews were never before seen and where the Jewish question never occurred to anyone. The same hatred for Jews is found in Vologda, Archangel, and the towns of Siberia and the Urals. He recounts several episodes affecting the perception of the simple Russian peasants, such as the Tayuman produce commissars, Indenbaums, ordered to shear sheep for the second time in the season, quote, because the republic needs wool. So already they're uh, turning the peasants into slaves and forcing them to give their goods to the communist. This was prior to collectivization, no less. These actions of this commissar caused the Ishim peasant uprising, I-S-H-I-M. The problem arose because it was late in the fall and the sheep would die without their coats from the coming winter cold. Maslov does not name the commissars who ordered the planting of millet and fried sunflower seeds or issued a prohibition on planting malt, but one can conclude they did not come from ordinary Russian folk or from the Russian aristocracy, or from, quote, yesterday's men. So yesterday's men, they have these, just like calling white men dinosaurs or pale, stale, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They have all these clever little verbal tags for all the categories that they hate due to their ideology. One of them was yesterday's men in Russian. From all this, the peasantry could only conclude that the power over them was, quote, Jewish, unquote. So too did the workers. Several workers' resolutions from the Urals in February and March of 1921 sent to the Kremlin, quote, complained with outrage of the dominance of Jews in central and local government. The intelligentsia, of course, does not think that Soviet power is Jewish, but it has noted the vastly disproportionate role of Jews in authority when compared to their numbers in the population. So all of Russia is noticing that this, these Soviets and Jews are damn near the same thing. Quote, and if a Jew approaches a group of non-Jews who are freely discussing Soviet reality, they almost always change the topic of conversation, even if the new arrival is a personal acquaintance. So they know, they're aware that Jews all talk among themselves, and there's a very real Jew network, and now that Jews are in power, talking loosely or freely among Jews could lead to you getting killed. Maslov tries to understand, quote, the cause of the widespread and bitter hatred of Jews in modern Russia, and it seems to him to be the, quote, identification throughout society of Soviet power and Jewish power. So the whole society, whether the old aristocrats or the peasants, the rural people or the urban middle classes, all understand that the Russian Revolution is a Jewish revolution, no matter what it's called. It's Jews taking power over our people and doing them harm. 
And that is what Jews always mean to all white people everywhere. And that is, might as well be a definition of their communism. The problem isn't political. It's only secondarily political. It's primarily racial. This race hates our race and tries to destroy it. Loxism is the name of Jewish hatred of whites. And communism is the day-to-day -day program they have for any country they take over. The expression Yid power is often used in Russia, and particularly in Ukraine, and in the former Pale of Settlement, not as a polemic, but as a completely objective definition of power, its content, and its politics. Quote, Soviet power in the first place answers the wishes and interests of the Jews, and they are its ardent supporters, and in the second place, power resides in Jewish hands. Again, this is a Jew academic admitting this all. Among the causes of Judeophobia, Maslow notes the, quote, tightly welded ethnic cohesion they have formed as a result of their difficult thousands-year-old history. Jews are very thick. They're very loyal, thick as thieves that they are. This is particularly noticeable when it comes to selecting staff at institutions. And there is, this is their famous nepotism. nepotism. If the selection process is, is in the hands of Jews, you can bet that the entire staff of responsible positions will go to Jews, even if it means removing the existing staff. And often that, quote, preference for their own is displayed in a sharp, discourteous manner, which is offensive to others. In the Jewish bureaucrat, Soviet power manifests more obviously in its negative features. The intoxicating wine of power is stronger for Jews and goes to their head. I don't know where this comes from. Perhaps because of the low cultural level of the former pharmacists and shopkeepers. They were just shtetl scum, basically. They don't know how to act. Maybe from living earlier without full civil rights, question mark. The Parisian Zionist journal Sunrise wrote in 1922 that Gorky essentially said that, quote, the growth of anti-Semitism is aided by the tactless behavior of the Jewish Bolsheviks themselves in many situations. Now, says Solzhenitsyn, that is the blessed truth, with an exclamation point, which he is not unwilling to use. He uses a lot of them. And Gorky wasn't speaking of Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev, that is, the Jews at the very top, the Presidium of the Executive Committee. He was speaking of the typical Jewish communist who occupies a position in the collegia, presidia, and petty and mid-level Soviet institutions where he comes into contact with large swaths of the population, like the Jew at the DMV or something. Such individuals occupy leading frontline positions, which naturally multiplies their number in the mind of the public. Deep Hasmanic comments, We must admit that many Jews through their own actions, provoke acute anti-Semitism, all the impudent Jews filling the communist ranks, these pharmacists, shopkeepers, peddlers, dropouts, and pseudo-intellectuals, are indeed causing much evil to Russia and Jewry. Quote, Hardly ever before inside of Russia or outside of Russia have Jews been the subject of such an active and concentrated hostility. It has never reached such an intensity nor been so widespread. This elemental hostility has been fed by the open and undeniable participation of Jews in destructive processes underway in Europe, as well as by the tales and exaggerations about such participation. Quote, a terrible anti-Semitic mood is taking hold, fed exclusively by Bolshevism, which continues to be identified with Jewry. In 1927, Mikhail Kozakov, shot in 1930 after the food workers' trial, wrote in a private letter to his brother overseas about the, quote, Judeophobic mood of the masses among non-party and party members. It is no secret, so it's not just in the non-Bolsheviks, but even the people in the Communist Party don't even, even like uh, what, what they see going on around them. It is no secret, it's still in the letter from Kozakov, that the mass of workers do not love the Jews. So again, Jews always pretend they replace your head of your people with their head, and then they they affect to speak for you. They're affected to speak for workers and peasants who can't stand them. And Shulgin, S-H-U-L-G-I-N, Shulgin, after his, quote, secret trip to the USSR in 1928, says, quote, no one says anymore that anti-Semitism is propaganda planted by the Tsar's government or an infection limited to the dregs of society. Geographically, it spreads wider each day, threatening to engulf all of Russia. The main center today seems to be Moscow. Anti-Semitism is a new phenomenon in Great Russia, but 
is much more serious than old anti-Semitism in the South. Anti-Semitism of the South of Russia was traditionally humorous and mitigated by anecdotes about Jews. Laren brings up anti-Jewish slogan allegedly used for propaganda purposes by the White Guards. Quote, Russians are sent to Narim, N-A-R-Y-M, Russians are sent to Narim, translators note, a, local, a locale in the far north, and Jews to the Crimea, translators note, a vacation is much warmer down there on the, on the Black Sea, Odessa, etc. The Soviet authorities eventually became seriously concerned with the rise of anti-Semitism. In 1923, the Jewish Tribune writes, albeit with skepticism, quote, the Commissariat of Internal Affairs has established a commission to study the question of protecting the Jews from dark forces. 1923, a commission is set up. In 1926, Kalinin and other functionaries received many questions about Jews in letters and at meetings. As a result, Laren undertook a study of the problem in a book of Jews and anti-Semitism in the USSR. From his own reports, queries, and interviews, taken, we can presume, from communist or communist sympathizers, he enumerates 66 questions from those the authorities received, recording them without editing the language. Among these questions, colon, were, so he lists a whole bunch of questions, we'll read them, interesting. This is a study of the problem of Jews and anti-Semitism. This is what the, the people, supposedly, or in theory, this would be representative of what people are seeing the changes that have come over the old Russian Empire and under this new Bolshevism. What, they, they have these questions, and they, they are, where are the Jews in Moscow coming from? Why is authority predominantly Jewish? How come Jews don't wait in line? How did Jews arriving from Berdichev and other cities immediately receive apartments? There is a joke that the last Jew left Berdichev and gave the keys to the city to Kalinin. Why did Jews have money and their own their own bakeries, etc.? Why are Jews drawn to light work and not to physical labor? Why did Jews in government service and in professions stick together and help each other while Russians do not? They do not want to work at everyday jobs, but are only concerned with their careers. Why do they not farm, even though it is now allowed them? Why are Jews given good land in the Crimea, while Russians are given inferior land? Why is the party opposition 76% Jewish? Translators note the opposition to the general line of the party, within the party itself. That might be a question of Russian communists with a Russian Bolshevik would ask about a Jewish Bolshevik. Why did anti-Semitism develop only against Jews and not against other nationalities? What should, and remember, this was the Russian Empire. There's loads of other nationalities. It's not just Jews. We think of it as racially, as they're all white, but yet still there are ethnic differences and they don't necessarily get along. Russians, Poles, Ukrainians. But there are different nationals and, you know, Tajiks, Uzbekis, Germans, um, there's, there's other nationalities inside Russia, not just Jews, but Jews are the only ones who occasion this reaction. What should a group agitprop leader do when he tries to counter anti-Semitic tendencies in his group and no one supports him? Moving on to 569. Laren suspects that these questions were dreamed up and spread among the masses by an underground organization of counter-revolutionaries, exclamation point, rather than being the actual organic reaction of the people to Jewish Bolshevism. As we will see later, this is where some official explanations came from, but he fixates on the unexpected phenomenon and tries to address scientifically the question, how could anti-Semitism take hold in the USSR and those strata of society, factory workers, students, where before the revolution it was little noted? His findings were anti-Semitism among the intelligentsia, among the intelligentsia, anti-Semitism is more developed than in any other group. However, he maintains that, quote, dissatisfaction rises not from the large number of Jews, but from the fact that Jews presume to enter into competition with the Russian intelligentsia for government jobs. The obvious development of anti-Semitic attitudes among city clerks and workers by 1928 cannot be explained by excessive numbers of Jews claiming jobs. Quote, among the intellectual professions, anti-Semitic tendencies are felt in the medical sphere and in engineering. The army has, quote, 
good political training, unquote, and there is no anti-Semitism here, even though the command staff of the Red Army has a significantly higher percentage of Jews than are present in the country as a whole, Saul quotes. Anti-Semitism among the urban bourgeoisie. The root of anti-Semitism is found in urban bourgeois Philistinism, but, quote, the battle against anti-Semitism among the bourgeoisie, it is mixed in with the question of the destruction of the bourgeoisie in general, that is the Goy bourgeoisie, not the Jew bourgeoisie. The anti-Semitism of the bourgeoisie will disappear when the bourgeoisie disappears. Again, wiping out the middle class, it is not really a synonym for bourgeois, but it, it, it shows the tendency to go through the upper, the truly upper to the upper middle class to the middle as the Jews exterminate and leave only slaves and Jews at the top. Their allied discolors, perverts, etc. Anti-Semitism in the countryside. We have almost completely pushed out the private trader of the peasant's grain. Therefore, among the peasant masses, anti-Semitism is not showing itself and has even weakened against its pre-war levels. Maybe they drove out some of the Jew middlemen. I, I don't know. Now it appears only in those areas where Jews have been resettled on the land, allegedly from kulaks and former landowners. A kulak is like uh, one of the higher-end farmers that they were going to starve in the Ukraine. Anti-Semitism among the working class. Anti-Semitism among the workers has grown noticeably stronger in recent years. By 1929, there could be no doubt of its existence. Now it occurs with more frequency and intensity than a few years ago. It is particularly strong among the, quote, backwards parts of the working class, that is, women and seasonal workers. However, an anti-Semitic mood can be observed among a broad spectrum of workers, not only among the corrupted fringe, quote-unquote. And here economic competition is not a factor. It arises even when there is no such competition. Jews make up only 2.7% of the working class. In the lower-level professional organizations, they tried to paint over anti-Semitism. Difficulties arise because attempts to, quote, hide anti-Semitism come from the active proletariat itself. Indeed, anti-Semitism originates from the active proletariat. Quote, in many cases, party members and members of Komsomol demonstrate anti-Semitism. Talk of Jewish dominance is particularly widespread, and in meetings one hears complaints that the Soviet authority limits itself to battles with the Orthodox religion alone. See, it's supposed to be anti-class and anti-religion, but it's pro-Jew and it's anti-any uh, religion that whites belong to, which would be Orthodox, and it's anti-white bourgeoisie, but it's pro-Jew bourgeoisie. What's savagery? So it's, it's a racial war masquerading as a class war. This is why also you'll hear often people claiming that the new... Uh, cultural Marxism is a change from old class Marxism, but that's still to take it at face value. It was always cultural uh, Marxism, and it was always, it, it, it's all front. It's economic and cultural, but it's ultimately, uh, those are just manifestations of the racial war of Jews on whites, and everything is understood as consequences or ramifications or down the line uh, results of that original racial war. That's the reality of it. Now, you're not going to get a Christian to say that, whether the Christian is Catholic E. Michael Jones or Orthodox Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but that's what it actually is. It's a racial war. What's savagery? Anti-Semitism among the proletariat? Question mark. Two exclamation points, like he's some kind of junior high girl. How could this occur in the most progressive and politically aware class in the world? Laren finds that it arose because of, quote, no other means remain for the white guard to influence the masses besides anti-Semitism. Its plan of action moves along the rails of anti-Semitism. This was a theory that was to have frightening consequences. Laren's views on the anti-Semitism of the time were to find echoes in later and other authors. S. Schwartz provides his own variant on anti-Semitism as being the result of a, quote, vulgar perception of Jews as the main carriers of the new economic policy, NEP, when they went back to a market for a time. But he agrees, the Soviet government, not without basis, saw in anti-Semitism a possible tool of the counter-revolution. 
1968, the author adds, quote, after the Civil War, anti-Semitism began to spread, gripping layers of society which were free of this tendency before the Revolution. Against this, it was necessary to engage not in academic discussion, but to act energetically and forcefully. In May 1928, the CK of the VKPB issued an agitprop communication about, quote, measures to be taken in the battle with anti-Semitism. As was often the case in implementation of party directives, related documents were not publicized but circulated among party organizations. The battle to create an atmosphere of intolerance of anti-Semitism was to be taken up in educational programs, public reports, lectures, the press, radio, and school text textbooks, and finally authorities were to apply the strictest disciplinary measures to those found guilty of anti-Semitic practices. Sharp newspaper articles followed. In Pravda's article by a highly connected Lev Sosnovsky, he incriminates all kinds of party and educational officials in anti-Semitism. An official in Kiev, quote, openly fires Jews, unquote, with the, quote, connivance of the local district party committee. Defamatory anti-Jewish graffiti is widespread, etc. From a newspaper article, with the growing battle against anti-Semitism, there are demands to solve the problem by increasing repression on those carriers of anti-Semitism and on those who protect them. Clearly, it was the GPU speaking through the language of a newspaper article. After Laren's report, the issue of anti-Semitism was included into various educational curricula, while Laren himself continued to research the ways to overcome anti-Semitism decisively. Quote, Until now, we were too soft, allowing propaganda to spread. Locally, officials often do not deal with anti-Semitism as rigorously as they should. Newspapers, quote, should not fear to point attention to the Jewish issue to avoid dissemination of anti-Semitism, as it only interferes with a fight against counter-revolutionary sabotage. Quote, anti-Semitism is a social pathology like alcoholism or vagrancy. Too often when dealing with communists, we let them off with mere censure. If a person goes to church and gets married, then we exclude him without discussion. Anti-Semitism is no less an evil. Quote, as the USSR develops toward socialism, the prognosis is good that Soviet anti-Semitism, that is anti-Semitism among the Bolsheviks themselves, and the legacy of pre-Soviet relationships will be torn out by the roots. Nevertheless, it is absolutely necessary to impose severe controls on intellectual anti-Semitism, especially in the teaching profession and civil service. So again, exactly what they do today. They try to dox and destroy anybody who goes against their line on Jews. But the very spirit of the brave 20s demands stronger language. Quote, the nature of modern-day anti-Jewish agitation in the USSR is political and not nationalistic. Agitation against the Jews is directed not just against Jews, but indirectly against the Soviet power. Or maybe not so indirect. Quote, Anti-Semitism is a means of mobilization against Soviet power. And, quote, those against the position of Soviet authorities in the Jewish question are against the working class and for the capitalist. So, ideological bilge. Any talk of, quote, Jewish dominance will be regarded as counter-revolutionary activity against the very foundation of the nationalities policy of the proletarian revolution. Parts of the intelligentsia, and sometimes the white guards, are using anti-Semitism to transmit bourgeois ideology. Yes, that's it. A white guard whispering campaign. Clearly there is, quote, planned agitation by secret white guard organizations, close quote. Behind, quote, the Philistine anti-Jewish agitation, secret monarchist organizations are leading a battle against Soviet power, unquote and from, quote, the central organs of anti-Soviet emigration, including Jewish bankers and czarist generals, an ideology is transmitted right into our factories, proving that anti-Jewish agitation in the USSR is class-based and not nationality-based. It is necessary to explain to the masses that encouragement of anti-Jewish feelings, in essence, is an attempt to lay the groundwork for counter-revolution. The masses must regard anyone who shows sympathy to anti-Semitism as a secret counter-revolutionary or the mouthpiece of a secret monarchist organization. There are conspiracies everywhere, he says with an exclamation point. 
The term anti-Semite must take on the same meaning in the public as the term counter-revolutionary. So Jews are fusing and identifying Jewishness with the revolution. In other words, they're reinforcing what the public is seeing and saying. The authorities had seen through everything and named everything for what it was. Counter-revolution, white guards, monarchists, white generals, and anyone suspected of being of the above. For the thick-headed, the revolutionary orator elaborates, quote, The methods to fight anti-Semitism are clear. At a minimum, to conduct open investigations and sessions of People's Tribunal against anti-Semitism, quote-unquote, at the local levels under the motto, quote, explanations for the backward workers, unquote, and, quote, repressions for the malicious, unquote. There is no reason why Lenin's decree, so-called, should not apply. Under Lenin's decree, that from July 27, 1918, active anti-Semites were to be placed outside of the law, that is, to be shot even for agitating for a pogrom, not just for participating in one. Shot for speech. Lenin's decree, July 27, 1918. Now, let's see. The law encouraged each Jew to register a complaint about any ethnic insult visited upon him. You'll note how similar that is to the way it is today in the U.S. A, U.S.S.A., to 100 years later. Now, sometime, almost exactly 100 years later. Now, some later author will object that the July 27 Act was ultimately not included in the law and was not part of the Criminal Code of 1922, though the Criminal Code of 1926 did include an article about the, quote, instigation of ethnic hostility and dissension, unquote. There were, quote, no specific articles about acts of anti-Semitism, unquote. This is not convincing, says Holtzneidson. Article 59.7 of the Criminal Code, quote, propaganda or agitation intended to incite national or religious hatred or dissension, unquote, was sufficient to send one to prison, and the article provided for confiscation of the property of perpetrators of, quote, widespread disturbances, unquote, and under aggravated circumstances, for instance, class origin, death. So you could be killed for writing or speaking against Jews, not even acting. Article 59.7 was based on the, quote, RSFSR Penal Code of February 26, 1927, which widened the definition of, quote, instigation of national hatred, making it equal in seriousness to, quote, dissemination or preparation of, and storing of literature. Storing books, exclamation point. How familiar is that proscription contained in the related law 5810? Translators note, the infamous Article 58 of the Penal Code of RSFSR dealt with so-called counter-revolutionary and anti-Soviet activities. Law 5810. Many brochures on anti-Semitism were published and, quote, finally, February 19, 1929, Pravda devoted its lead article to the matter, Attention to the Battle with Anti-Semitism. A 1929 resolution of CK of Communist Party of Belarusia stated that, quote, counter-revolutionary nature of anti-Semitic incidents is often ignored and that organs of justice should, quote, intensify the fight, prosecuting both perpetrators of the law and those who inspire them. The secretary of the CK of Komsomol said, quote, most dangerous in our conditions are secret anti-Semites who hide their anti-Semitic attitudes. Those who are familiar with Soviet language understand it is necessary to cut off suspected ways of thinking. This recalls Grigory Landau speaking of Jewish opponents. Quote, they suspect or accuse other groups around them of anti-Semitism. Anyone who voices a negative opinion about Jews is accused of being an open anti-Semite, and others are called secret anti-Semites. The only two classes Goyim fall into. In 1929, a certain I. Zilberman in Daily Soviet Jurisprudence, number four, writes that there were too few court trials relating to anti-Semitism in Moscow province. 
In the city of Moscow alone for the year, there were only 34 cases. That is, every 10 days there was a trial for anti-Semitism somewhere in Moscow. The Journal of Narkomust was read as an instruction manual for bringing such cases. Could the most evil anti-Semite have thought up a better way to identify Jews with Soviet power in the opinion of the people? It went so far that in 1930, the Supreme Court of RSFSR ruled that Article 59.7, quote, should not be used by members of national minorities seeking redress in conflicts of a personal nature. That is, every time Jews have a wine, they accuse the, the person they, they're disputing as being an anti-Semite. In other words, the judicial juggernaut had already been wound up and was running at full speed. So there you go. You see Jews, as soon as they take power, it's criminal to criticize a Jew. It must be hunted out. You're counter-revolutionary. You want your own people running the country instead of Jews. That's evil. You should be shot for that. Same mentality, always. Always the patterns are what matter, and the pattern with Jews, the same mentality, the same behavior, the same view of themselves, and the same view of non-Jews, particularly whites. Always loxism. The indispensable concept. If we look at life of regular, this is a new section now, not commanding Jewish folks, we see desolation and despair in formerly vibrant and thriving shtetls. Remember, they all left for the capitals. Jewish Tribune reported, reproduced report by a special official who inspected towns and shtetls in the southwest of Russia in 1923, indicating that as the most active inhabitants moved into cities, the remaining population of elders and families with many children lived to a large extent by relying on humanitarian and financial aid from America. We're on 573 now. Indeed, by the end of the period of war communism, that is 1918 to 1920, when all trade or any buying and selling were prohibited under threat of property confiscation and fines, this is before the new economic policy and what led to it, the reliberalization of the market, the reallowing of the market because the people were starving, the Jews were helped by Jewish charities like joint through the All-Russian Public Committee for, quote, assistance to victims of pogroms and destitute Jews. Several other charities protected the Jewish population at later at different times, such as the SC, or Society of Craftsmen, which after the revolution moved abroad, EKOPO, the Jewish Committee for Assistance to Victims of War, and EKO, the Jewish Colonizing Society. In 1921-22, Soviet-based Jewish charities functioned in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Despite intervention and obstacles from Yevsex, Jewish communist organizations, Yevsex, Quote, joint provided Soviet Jews with extensive financial and other assistance, whereas SC, quote, was dedicated to establishment and development of Jewish industry and agriculture in the south of Ukraine during the first half of the 1920s. The first Soviet census provides insight into Jewish life during the liberalized NEP period. Forty percent of Jews were classified as active, that is, not dependents. Of those, 28 percent were public servants. 21% craftsmen, 19% industry workers, including apprentices, 12% merchants, 9% peasants, 1% military men, and 10% were classified as others. Among public servants, Jews were well represented in trade-related occupations. For instance, in Moscow, business organizations, 16% of the clerks were Jews. In credit and trade organizations, 13%. 30% according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. In public organizations, 19% in fiscal organizations, 9% in Sav Deps, 10% with virtually no presence in the police force. The percentages were correspondingly higher in the former Pale of Settlement areas, up to 62% in the state trade of Belarusia, 44% in Ukraine, 77% in the category of private state servants. The flow of Jewish workers into industry was much slower than government wished. There were almost no Jews among railroad men and miners. They rather preferred the professions of tailor, tanner, typographer, woodworker, and food-related specialties in other fields of consumer industry. Almost no Jews are among railroad men and miners. They don't like mining or railroads. To recruit Jewish workers into industry, specialized professional schools were created with predominantly foreign funding, from Jewish organizations abroad. It was the time of NEP which, quote, improved economic conditions of Jewish population within a new Soviet framework. 
1924, Moscow, 75% of the perfume and pharmaceutical trade was in Jewish hands. Three quarters. 1924, Moscow, as well as 55% of the manufactured goods trade, 49% of the jewelry trade, 39% of the small ware trade, and 36% of the wood depots. I guess that's lumber yards. Starting business in a new place, a Jew usually ran down, ran down prices in the private sector to attract clientele. They undercut. The first and most prominent NEP men often were Jews. To a large extent, anger against them stemmed from the fact that they utilized the Soviet as well as the market systems. Their commerce was routinely facilitated by their links and pulls in the Soviet apparatus, that is, their, their Jew friends in the Soviet system. Sometimes such connections were exposed by authorities, as in the famous case of Paraffin Affair, 1922. During the 1920s, there were abundant opportunities to buy up belongings of oppressed and persecuted, quote, former, unquote, people, especially high-quality or rare furniture. S. Edinger notes that Jews made a majority of NEP men, new economic policy men, and new, new riches, or nouveau riche, which was supported by an impressive list of individuals who, quote, failed to pay state taxes and dues in his Vestia in 1929. However, at the end of NEP, authorities launched, quote, anti-capitalist assault against financiers, merchants, and manufacturers, many of whom were Jewish. As a result, many Jews turned into, quote, Soviet trade servants, and continued working in the same spheres of finance, credit, and commerce. A steamroller of merchandise and property confiscations, outright state robbery and social ostracizing, outclassing people into disenfranchised Lishinets category, was advancing on private commerce. Quote, so they go back and forth. They toggle from communism to new economic policy and then back to communism, and Jews are just hopping, skipping, and jumping, and they have special advantages because they have a lot of relatives in, in the uh, government. Some Jewish merchants, attempting to avoid discriminating and endlessly increasing taxation, declared themselves as having no occupation during the census. Nevertheless, quote, virtually the entire Jewish male population in towns and shtetls passed through the torture chambers of GPU during the campaign of gold and jewelry extortion in the beginning of the 1930s. We'll hear about that next chapter. Such things would be regarded as an impossible nightmare in Tsar's Russia. Many Jewish families, to avoid the stigma of being Lishenets, that's a special category, L-I-S-H-E-N-E-T-S, I've never heard of that before, I guess like bad commerce guy or something, moved into large cities, so they're trying to get away from these new taxes when they revoked NEP. In the end, only one-fifth of Soviet Jews lived in the traditional Jewish settlements by the 1930s. Quote, Socioeconomic experiments by the Soviet authorities, including all kinds of nationalization and socialization, had not only devastated the middle classes, but also hit badly the small merchants and craftsmen. Due to general lack of merchandise and solvent customers, as well as low liquidity and exorbitant taxes, many shtetl merchants had no other choice but to close down their shops, and while the most active left for the cities, the remaining populace has nothing else to do but aimlessly roam decrepit streets, loudly complaining about their fate, people, and God. It is apparent that Jewish masses have completely lost their economic foundations. It was really like, like that in many shtetls at the time. To address the problem, even a special resol resolution of Savnarkam was issued in 1929. G. Simon, a former immigrant, came to USSR at the end of the 20s as an American businessman with a mission, quote, to investigate shortages of Jewish craftsmen and tools. Later in Paris, he published a book with an emotional and ironic title, Jews Rule Over Russia. Describing the situation with Jewish manufacturing and trade, its oppression and destruction by Soviets, he also shares his impressions. Quoting many conversations, the general mood of the populace is pretty gloomy. Quote, many bad things, many crimes happen in Russia these days, but it's better to suppress that blinding hatred. Unquote. Quote, they often fear that the revolution will inevitably end in the Russian manner, i.e. by mass murder of Jews. 
A local Bolshevik Jew suggests that, quote, it's only the revolution that stands between the Jews and those wishing to ag aggrandize Russia by the rape of Jewish women and the spilling the blood of Jewish children. So they're always projecting what they do to others is going to happen to themselves. Remember, in all the pogroms we heard about in earlier chapters, at most there was like 38 people killed, or Jews, if you don't like people. A well-known economist, B.D. Brutskus, who in 1920 provided a damning analysis of the socialist economy. He was expelled from the country in 1922 by Lenin. This is Brutskus, B-R-U-T, Brutskus, S-K-U-S. He published an extensive article, quote, Jewish population under communist power in contemporary notes in 1928, chronicling the NEP in the former Pale of Settlement areas of Ukraine and Belarusia. The relative importance of private enterprise was declining as even the smallest merchants were deprived of their political rights. They became disenfranchised lishinets and couldn't vote in Soviet elections. And thus their civil rights, in contrast, handscraftsmen still enjoyed a semblance of rights. Quote, the fight of Soviet authorities against private enterprise and entrepreneurs is in large part a fight against the Jewish populace, said Brutskus. Because in those days, quote, not only almost the entire private enterprise in Ukraine and Belarusia was represented by Jews, but the Jewish participation in the small capitalist upper class in capital cities of Moscow, St. Petersburg, and Kharkov had also become very substantial. Brutskus distinguished three periods during the NEP, 1921-23, to 23-25, to and 25-27. to 27. Quote, Development of private enterprise was least impeded by communists during the first two and a half years when Bolsheviks were still overwhelmed by their economic debacles, that is, they're trying to recover from their stupidity of their, their uh, war communism. The first communist reaction followed between the end of 1923 and the spring of 1925. Wholesale and shop trade in the former Pale of Settlement was destroyed, with only small flea market trade still permitted. So, all these Jews who are traders and merchants are getting hurt by the Soviets. Uh, but of course, they also destroyed the Russians. So they're trying to implement true communism and, and doing the usual stupid things that are that deny the incentives that all people, Jews or, or whites, would respond to, thus immiserating the population. And of course, it's going to hit, if Jews are most of the merchants, it's going to hit them harder than, than others. Crafts were, quote, burdened by taxation. So again, taxation, regulation, and outright murder and uh, def defamation in the press are all levied against anyone who's trying to make a, make a dollar. Artisans lost their last tools and materials, the latter often belonged to their peasant customers, to confiscation, so they're grabbing and seizing stuff. The concept of Jewish equality virtually turned into fiction as two-thirds of Jews lost their voting rights. Because Yevsek, the Jewish section of the Communist Party, Quote, inherited specific hatred toward petty Jewish bourgeoisie cultivated by earlier Jewish socialist parties. So, yeah, there's some distinction between Jews and a lot of the Jew communists did not like these other uh, bourgeois Jews. And saw their own purpose in fighting it, petty Jewish bourgeoisie. Its policy in the beginning of NEP was substantially different from the general party line. During the second part of NEP, the, quote, Yevsek attempted to complete the dismantling of Jewish bourgeoisie, which began with war communism. However, information about bleak life of Jewish population in USSR was leaking out into Jewish press abroad. Quote, Yevsek, that is, Jews in the, in the Soviets, attempted to blame that, the destruction of these training classes or petty bourgeoisie Jews, they tried to blame that on the Tsar's regime, which allegedly obstructed Jewish participation in productive labor, that is, by communist definition, in physical labor. Actually, it tried to pay them and bribe them to become farmers, gave them land and gave them money on great terms. And since Jews still prefer, quote, unproductive labor, they inevitably suffer. Soviet authority has nothing to do with it. Move on to 576. But 
Brutskis objected, claiming that in reality it was the opposite. Quote, the class of Jewish craftsmen nearly disappeared with the annihilation of petty Jewish manufacture. Indeed, professional Jewish classes grew and became diversified, while excessive numbers of petty Jewish middlemen slowly decreased under the Tsar because of the gradual development of ethnic Russian enterprise and deepening business connections between the Pale of Settlement and Inner Russia. But now the Jewish population again was turned into a mass of petty middlemen. During the third period of NEP, from the spring of 1925 to the autumn of 1926, large tax remissions were made for craftsmen and street vendors and village fairs were relieved of taxation, while activities of state financial inspectors supervising large businesses were brought, quote, under the law. The economy and well-being of the Jewish population started to recover rapidly. It was a boom for Jewish craftsmen and merchants specializing in agriculture. Petty manufacturing grew and, quote, successfully competed for raw materials and resources with state manufacture in the western provinces. At the same time, a new decree granted political and therefore certain civil rights to many Jews. The second communist assault on private enterprise, which eventually resulted in the dismantling of NEP, began at the end of 1926. Quote, first, private grain trade was prohibited followed by bans on raw skins, oil seeds, and tobacco trade. Private mills, creameries, tanneries, and tobacco houses were expropriated. Fixed prices on shop merchandise were introduced in the summer of 1927. Most craftsmen couldn't work because of the shortage of raw materials, so again, typically stupid wage and price controls. The state of affairs in the shtetls of Western Russia alarmed international Jewry. For instance, Pasmanic wrote in 1922 that Jews as people are doomed to disappear under the Bolsheviks and that communists reduced all Russian Jewry into a crowd of paupers. However, the Western public, including Jews, did not want to hear all this. The West saw the USSR in good light, partly because of general left-leaning of European intelligentsia, but mainly because the world and American Jewry were now confident in bright future and security of Russian Jews, and skillful Soviet propaganda only deepened this oppression. So the Western so-called press is a Jewish press, and all it cares about is what is good for Jews, even if actual Jews in Russia were maybe being uh, harmed by this, some of them, not the ones in the party, obviously. Benevolent, and nothing is said about what the harm done to the Russians. Benevolent public opinion was extremely instrumental for Soviet leaders in securing Western and especially American financial aid, which was indispensable for economical recovery after their brave, quote, war communism, after the failure of their stupid policies. As Lenin said at the Party Congress in 1921, quote, as the revolution did not spread to other countries, we should do anything possible to secure assistance of big progressive capitalism, and for that we are ready to pay hundreds of millions and even billions from our immense wealth, our vast resources, because otherwise our recovery would take decades. And the business went smoothly, as progressive capitalism, called woke today, showed no scruples about acquiring Russian wealth, so they steal stuff and sell it off to the West. The first Soviet international bank, Roscom Bank, founded in 1922, was founded in 1922, R-O-S-K-O-M Bank. The first Soviet international bank, Roscom Bank, was founded in 1922. It was headed by the already mentioned Olaf Ashberg, who was reliably delivering aid to Lenin during the entire revolutionary period, and by former Russian private bankers Schlesinger, Kalashkin, and Ternovsky. There was also Max May of Morgan Guarantee Trust in the U.S., who was of great assistance to Soviets. Now they developed a scheme of allowing a Roscom Bank to directly purchase goods in the U.S., despite the feudal protest from the Secretary of State, Charles Hughes, who asserted that this kind of relations meant a de facto recognition of the Soviet regime. And remember, they were not recognized until 33 under FDR. Uh, they were seen as what they were, simply a criminal takeover of Russia by a primarily Jewish group. A Roscom Bank Swedish advisor, Professor G. Cassell, said that it is reckless to leave Russia with all her resources alone. 
concessioners flocked into USSR where they were very welcome. Here we see Lenin's favorite, Armand Hammer, who in 1921 decided, quote, to help rebuild Ural industry and procured a concession on asbestos mines at Alapayevsk. Lenin mentioned in 1921 that Hammer's father will provide, quote, two million stones of bread on very favorable terms, 5%, in exchange for Ural jewelry to be sold in America. And Hammer shamelessly exported Russian art treasures in exchange for the development of pencil manufacturing. Later, in the times of Stalin and Khrushchev, Hammer frequented Moscow, continuing to export Russian cultural treasures, e.g. church utensils, icons, paintings, china, etc., in huge volumes. However, in 1921 and 22, large sums were donated by American Jewry and distributed in Russia by the American Relief Administration, ARA, for assistance to the victims of, quote, bloody pogroms, for the rescue of towns in the south of Russia, and for the peasantry of Volga region. Many ARA associates were Jews. End of that section. Another novel idea from the 20s. Not so much an idea originating among Jews as one dreamed up to appeal to them was Jewish colonization of agricultural land. It is said their history of dispersion had denied them possibilities in agriculture and forced them to engage in money lending, commerce, and trade. Now at last Jews could occupy the land and thereby renounce the harmful ways of the past to labor productively under Soviet skies, thus putting to flight the unflattering myths which had grown up about them, that they don't want to do honest work. Soviet authorities turned to the idea of colonization part, partially to improve productivity, but mostly for political reasons. This was sure to bring a swell of sympathy, but more important, financial aid. Brutskas writes, quote, The Soviet government, needing credits, searched for support among the foreign bourgeoisie and highly valued its relations with the foreign Jewish bourgeoisie. However, towards 1924, the donations stopped pouring in, and even, quote, the Jewish American Charity, or Joint Committee, was forced to halt its work in Europe to again collect large amounts of money, as they had through the American Relief Associate Administration in 1921, they needed to create, as they say in the U.S., a boom. Colonization became the boom for Jewish charities. Colonization. The grandiose project for resettling 100,000 Jewish families on their own land was, apparently, mostly a public relations ploy. The Committee for the, quote, State Land Trust for Jewish Laborers, or COMZET, was founded in 1924, followed by the, quote, All-Soviet Volunteer Land Society of Jewish Laborers, or OZ. So COMZET and OZ. I remember as school children, says Solzhenitsyn, we were made to join and pay membership dues by bringing money from home to ODD, a Society of Friends of the Children, and OZET. In many countries, sister organizations to OZET sprung up, like UNICEF or something for Jews. Hey, let's get these Jews their own land and turn them into honest. How many times has that been tried? It was immediately clear that, quote, the assistance of the Soviet government in the passage of poor Jews to the land was, quote, a matter of international significance. Through this, the foreign proletariat could judge the, quote, power and solidity of the Soviet government. This development had the active participation and financial support of the powerful American joint, the Jewish Chronicle of London, October 16, 1925. I think a word was left out there, Amer American Joint Committee or something. Quote, from the Jewish Chronicle in 1925, out of London, the Crimea has been offered as a replacement for Palestine. Why send Jews to Palestine, which is so unproductive, and which will mean so much sacrifice and hard work, when the rich land of Ukraine and the fruited fields of the Crimea are smiling upon suffering Jews. Again, Ukraine is supposedly has like some of the most topsoil in the world, like nine feet of it, I, I think. It's a natural breadbasket, so good place to farm. And Crimea, I don't know, but it'd certainly be warmer. I guess you can, you can grow, you know, crops like California or something. Moscow will be the benefactor and defender of Russian Jewry and will be able to seek moral support from Jews around the globe. As well, the plan will cost nothing, as American Jews are covering all expenses. It didn't take the Russian emigre press long to recognize the Soviet maneuver. P. Struve, 
S-T-R-U-V-E, we've heard of him before, in the Parisian journal Renaissance wrote, quote, this entire undertaking serves to bind Jewry, both Russian and international, to communist power, bind Jewry to communist power, and definitively mark Jews with a brand of communism. In the lead editorial from the Berlin Rule, it's true the world identifies the Bolsheviks with the Jews. There is a need to further connect them with shared responsibility for the fate of hundreds of thousands of poor. Then you can trick wealthy American Jews with the threat. The fall of Soviet power followed by a mass pogrom which sweeps away all the Jewish societies they founded. Therefore, they will support Soviet power at all costs. In a fateful, and again, they've lied, 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 lied about the Tsar. And so they've set everybody up to believe Jews are always on the verge of being wiped out by evil goyim. They need to take power. And, and now that they have taken power, if the regime they created is goes away, they will all be massacred by the evil pogrom inciting goyim. Actually, in a fateful irony, the Bolshevik bluff meant American enterprise and the Americans fell for it, not knowing what was going on in the USSR. Actually, the world Jewish community was excited by hope in the rehabilitation of Jewish agriculture. In September 1925, at the all-German session, the Jewish bourgeoisie under the director of the leadership of under the leadership of the director of the German National Bank, Hjalmar Schacht, decided to support the project. Leon Blum founded the, quote, Jewish Construction Fund, unquote, in France, which sent tractors to the settlers. The, quote, Society for Aid for Jewish Land Colonization was founded in New York. In countries around the globe, all the way to South Africa, money was collected for the colonization plan from social democrats, anarchists, and, so they say, ordinary workers. The editors of the American magazine Morning Journal posed the question, as did many others, is it ethical for Russian Jews to colonize land that was expropriated? The Jewish Chronicle recalled that most of the former landowners were in prison, shot, or exiled. They were answered by the leading American jurist, Louis Marshall, one of the top five most powerful Jews in the USA at that time, and chairman of the World Joint Committee, who claimed the beneficent right of revolutionary expropriation. Indeed, during the years 1919 to 1923, quote, more than 23,000 Jews had settled in former estates near the towns and villages in the former Pale of Settlement, land seized from nobles. By spring 1923, no more of this land remained available, and the first small groups of Jews started to form for resettlement to the free steppe land in southern Ukraine, S-T-E-P-P-E, -E, the steppes, southern Ukraine. This movement picked up speed after 1925. The International Jewish Agro Joint was formed by Marshall with the banker Paul Warburg, who brought the U.S. the Central Bank and the Federal Reserve from Europe, as the director of the International Jewish Agro Joint. Here, our chroniclers of the history of communism declined to issue a denunciation of class enemies and instead approve of their efforts. So yeah, if they're Jews, it doesn't matter if they're capitalist or not. The Agro Joint, hyphenated, concluded an agreement with the Comzet about the contribution of tractors, farm machinery, seed, the digging of artesian wells, and professional training for Jewish youth. EKO assisted as well. At a 1926 session of Ozet, Kalinin, Kalinin spoke, against, spoke out forcefully against any plans for Jewish assimilation and, instead, proposed a wide-ranging program for Jewish autonomy known in the West as the Kalinin Declaration. I'm not sure where the, where the accent falls. K-A-L-I-N-I-N. Linen with a K-A. Kalinin Declaration. The early plans called for resettlement to the south of Ukraine and northern Crimea of approximately 100,000 families, or 20%, one-fifth, of the entire Jewish population of the USSR. The plans contemplated separate Jewish national regions as well. Quote, many remained jobless and nevertheless declined the opportunity to work, unquote. And, quote, only half of all Jews who agreed to resettle actually took up residence in the villages they were supposed to resettle in. So they want to be middlemen and traders. What they want is, is legal relief from the Soviets. They don't want to become farmers. 
However, American Zionists objected to the OZET plan and saw in the, quote, propaganda for the project of widespread Jewish agricultural colonization in the Soviet Union a challenge to Zionism and its idea for the settlement of Eretz Israel. So they're saying there's a competitor with Israel and Zionism in Palestine is this idea of let's settle Jews in, the, in Crimea and Ukraine. Ozet falsely claimed its plans did not contradict at all the idea of colonization of Palestine. Great hope was placed on Crimea. There were 455,000 hectares given over to Jewish colonization in Ukraine and Belarusia, 697,000 hectares set aside in Crimea for that purpose. According to the 10-year plan for the settlement of Jews in Crimea, the Jewish proportion of the population was to grow from 8% in 1929 to 25% in 1939. It was assumed that the Jews would substantially outnumber the Tatars by that time. Quote, there shall be no obstacles to the creation in the Crimean ASSR, a Northern Crimean Autonomous Jewish Republic, or Oblast. So they have all these specific words for territory in Russian. The Oblast, I think, would be another. The settlement of the Jews in the Crimea provoked the hostility of the Tatars. Quote, are they giving Crimea to the Jews? Question mark. And dissatisfaction of local landless peasants. Laren writes, quote, evil and false rumors are circulating throughout the country about the removal of land from non-Jews, the expulsion of non-Jews, and the particularly strong support the authorities have given to the Jewish settlers. It went so far that the chairman of the CIK of the Crimean ASSR, Veli Ibramov, published an interview in the Simfropol paper, Red Crimea, which Laren does not quote from, but which he claims was a manifestation of, quote, evil bourgeois chauvinism in a call for a pogrom. We move on to 580, just a couple pages left. Ibramov, also pro, <coughs> I-B-R-A-I-M-O-V, Ibramov also promulgated a resolution and projects which were, quote, not yet ready for publication, also not quoted by Laren, for this, Laren denounced Ibramov to the Central Control Commission of CK of VKPB, recounting the incident with pride in his book. As a result, Ibramov was removed and then shot, after which the Jewish colonization of Crimea gained strength. As was typical for the communist regime, the closed trial of Ibramov resulted in a political conviction for, quote, connections with a Kulak bandit gang, unquote officially for, quote, banditry, unquote. A certain Mustafa, the assistant to the chair of the CIK, was also shot with Ibramov as a bandit. Rumors of the effective assistance given to the Jewish settlers did not die down. The authorities tried to counter them. A government newspaper in 1927 wrote, quote, the generous assistance to Jewish settlers is coming from Jewish community organizations, without me mentioning they were Western organizations, so the support's coming from abroad and not from the government, as is rumored. To refute the rumors, Schlichter, the young brawler from Kiev's Duma in October 1905, now Narcom of Agriculture in Ukraine, toured over the south of Ukraine. Rumors that the Jews were not working the land given to them, but were renting it out or hiring farm laborers were met with, quote, We haven't observed this behavior, but the Jewish settlers must be forbidden to rent out their land. And, quote, the unhealthy atmosphere surrounding the Jewish resettlement must be countered with the widest possible education campaign. The article allows one to judge about the scale of events. It states that 630 Jewish households moved into Kherson province, K-H-E-R-S-O-N, between the end of 1925 and July of 1927. 630 in Kherson. In 1927, there were 48 Jewish agricultural settlements in Ukraine, with a total population of 35,000. In Crimea, 4,463 Jews lived in Jewish agricultural settlements in 1926 in Crimea. Other sources implausibly claimed that, quote, by 1928, 220,000 Jews lived in Jewish agricultural colonies, unquote. Similarly, Laren mentioned 200,000 by the beginning of 1929. Where does this order of magnitude discrepancy come from? That is, order of magnitude is, means 10 times, technically. 
Laren here contradicts himself, saying that in 1929, the share of Jews in agriculture was negligible, less than 0.2%, and almost 20% among merchants, and 2% of the population in general. Mayakovsky saw it differently. Quote, a hard-toiling Jew tills the rocky land. That's like a poetic couplet. However, the program of Jewish land colonization, for all practical purposes, was a failure just like it was a failure back in the 1800s. For many of the settlers, there was little motivation to stay. It didn't help that the resettlement and the building project had come from on high and the money from Western organizations. A lot of government assistance for Jewish settlers didn't help. It is little known that tractors from neighboring collective farms were ordered to till the Jewish land. Despite the flow of two to 3,000 resettling Jewish families by the end of five-year work, quote, Jewish settlements in Crimea listed only around 5,000 families instead of pre-planned 10 to 15,000. The reason was that settlers frequently returned to their place of origin or moved to the cities of Crimea or other parts of the country. This mass departure of Jews from agriculture in the 1920s and 30s resembles similar Jewish withdrawal from agricultural colonies in the 19th century, albeit now there were many new occupations available in industry and in administration, a field prohibited for Jews in Tsarist Russia. So, when the USSR becomes a thing, well, heck, there are some government jobs they can get. They sure would rather have that, shifting paper and killing people, rather than uh, doing honest farm labor. And, eventually, collectivization arrived. Suddenly, in 1930, Semyon Diamondstein, for many years the head of the, quote, Jewish section, of CK of VKPB, a staunch communist who bravely put up with all Soviet programs in the 1920s, came out in the press against universal collectivization in the national regions. He was attempting to protect the Jewish colony from collectivization, which he had been, quote, warned about, unquote. However, collectivization came, not sparing the fresh shoots of Jewish land stewardship. At almost the same time, the Jewish and non-Jewish Kolkotses were combined under the banner of internationalism, that's collective farm, and the program of Jewish settlement in Ukraine and Crimea was finally halted. So they're going to collectivize the farm and starve the people. The principal Soviet project of Jewish colonization was at Birobidzhan, B-I-R-O-B-I-D-Z-H-A-N, a territory, quote, nearly the size of Switzerland, between the two branches of the Amur River, A-M-U-R, near the Chinese border. It has been described variously. In 1956, Khrushchev bragged in conversations with Canadian communists that the soil was rich, the climate was southern, there was, quote, much sun and water, and rivers filled with fish, and vast forests. The socialist Vesnik described it as, covered with, quote, wild taiga, Swampland made up a significant portion of the, unquote, of the territory, so not good or not good. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, quote, a plain with swamps in places, but a fertile land among the Am along the Amur. So maybe a mix of both. The project came about in 1927 from the Comzet, a committee of the CIK, and it was intended to, quote, turn a significant part of the Jewish population into a settled agricultural people in one location, Kalinin. Also, the Jewish Autonomous Republic was to serve as a counterweight to Zionism, creating a national homeland with at least half a million population. One possible motive behind the plan, which cannot be excluded, to wedge a loyal Soviet population into the hostile Cossack frontier. Ozet set a scientific expedition to Birobidzhan in 1927, and before large settlements of Jews began arriving, in 1928 started preparations and building for the settlement using laborers from the local populace and wandering work crews of Chinese and Koreans. So this is way out in the boonies. Older residents of the area, and I encourage you, you really should, if you're listening to this, you should really look at a map. Look at a map of the Soviet Union. And look where all the rivers are. Look where Crimea is. Look where Odessa is. Look where Belarus is. Look where Ukraine is. Look where Moldova is. Look where Poland is. Look where the Chinese border is. Look where Siberia is. Look at a geographical map and see where the taiga is and the tundra and uh, 
again, as I said, all the rivers, and, and this is necessary. This is the skeleton of which you hang all your specific knowledge of the actual playing field here that we're talking about. Older residents of the area, trans Baikal Cossacks, exiled there between the 1860s and the 1880s and already testified by the hardships of the frontier woods, remember being concerned about the Jewish settlements. Settlement. The Cossacks needed vast tracts of land for their farming methods and feared they would be crowded out of lands they used for hunting and hay harvesting. The Comzet Commission report was, quote, a preliminary plan for the possible gradual resettlement of 35,000 families, but reality was different. The CIK of VKPB in 1928 assigned Bureau Bijan for Jewish colonization and preparation of first settler trains began immediately. For the first time ever, city dwellers from Ukraine and Belarusia, without any preparation for agricultural labor, were sent to farm the land. They were lured by the prospect of having the status of Lishinets removed. The Komsomol published the monthly Ozet, and pioneer delegations traveled around the country collecting for the Birobidzhan resettlement. The hastily dispatched Jewish families were horrified by the conditions they met on arrival. They moved into barracks at the Tekhonkia Railroad Station in the future town of Birobichan. Quote, Among the inhabitants were some who never left the barracks for the land, living off the loans and credits they managed to obtain for making the move. Others, less nimble, lived in abject poverty. Quote, During the first year of work at Birobichan, only 25 huts were built, only 125 hectares were plowed, and none were planted. Many did not remain in Birobichan. Thousand workers arrived in the spring of 1928, and by July, 25% of all those who had arrived in 1928 had left. By February 1929, more than half the population had abandoned Birobidjan. From 1928 to 1933, more than 18,000 arrived, yet the Jewish population grew by only 6,000. By some calculations, only 14% of those Jews who resettled remained in 1929. They returned either to their homes or moved to Kar Karborovsk and Vladivostok, the more established towns. Last paragraph here for today. Laren, who devotes no small number of reasoned and impassioned pages to the building of Jewish agriculture, sniffs that, quote, an unhealthy fuss has been raised about Barobidjan, a utopian settlement of a million Jews. Resettlement was practically presented as a national obligation of Soviet Jews. Zionism turned inside out a kind of back-to-the-province movement. While international Jewish organizations provided no finances for Bureau Bijan, from the beginning, quote, considering it too expensive and risky for them, more likely the Western Jewish organizations, that is, AgroJoint, ORT, and EKO, could not support the distant project beyond the Urals. It wasn't a, quote, Jewish plan, but a scheme of Soviet authorities eager to tear down and build life anew in the country. And that's where we'll leave it for today. So we've heard about increasing understanding of the Russians that we are discriminated against and we are, are killed and murdered, discriminated against and hated by the Soviets. And they are actually Jews and the Jews suppressing this and then, you know, trying to come up with various projects. And we look at the way Jews were treated generally and the ones outside the party, if they were traitors, yeah, some of them did suffer from uh, if they weren't connected or whatever. And they tried to yet again, turn them to agriculture. And of course that didn't work because they didn't want to do it. They'll take money, they'll take credits, they'll take whatever you give them, but they'll quickly sell it and go back to their old ways. This has been recording number 28 out of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's 200 Years Together, permanently archived at vnnform.com. I want to thank you for being here with me today and as we learn about the Soviet Union and learn more about Jews. And I will be back with you again for more from Solzhenitsyn real, real soon.